live? Yes, sir, it is. Holy moly. All right. So, so say everything you wanted to ever say. Oh, wait. No. <laughs> Hold on a second. Oh, yeah, can I cut? Can I, what's yeah, yeah. on? You are listening to yep. the Mario Report. Okay. Hold on just a second. Let me play this music. Adventures in the mysteries of life, as well as the hot topics of the day, either political or business. Before I forget, because I know tonight's show is going to be fun, because I'm already having fun with our guests, and we haven't even started yet. Actually, I just kind of cut him off to uh, start the show, because I didn't want to start into a, down a rabbit hole before we got to Son started. Son of a bitch! <laughs> cut me off! I know, right? Uh, before I forget, go over and uh, get your free ebook, uh, 75 Tips Before Starting a Podcast. I'm not sure why I, I wrote this, or I'm not sure why I'm giving it away. So here we go. Uh, my guest tonight is Manu Mentor. Imer- Manu, how do you say your last name? Because I've stumbled on it twice, and I'm going to mispronounce it either way. Wait a second. Why Why do you not know why you're giving away the ebook? Did you actually write the ebook? I did. Oh, so you do know why you're giving it away. Yeah, I do know why I'm giving it away. It's a good line, though. Like, I yeah. should be selling it, uh-huh. right? So I don't know why I'm giving it away. Uh-huh. Say your last yeah. name for me. My last name is I as an igloo, N as in Nancy, like a little Nancy, but not in that way. T as in Thomas. I is an igloo, a little cold, shivery place. I N T I, that's the first four letters. Then R as in radical. A is an apple. Y is in yak. Yaks freak me out, by the way. So that's N T. So I N T I so far. R A Y. M is in Mary, like the Virgin Mary. <laughs> <laughs> and the I is an igloo again, as like the cold, shivery place. So, so that's I N T I R A Y M I. So now say it. How do you actually say that? Ente I, Reme. You ente. pronounce it Ente Reme. So I uh, I was cut Manu off because I, I, I started, he started to ask why we were here and we, I kind of gave him a rundown. And but I actually the real reason he's here is because this idiot. Oh goodness, this had to have been. Is it really that long ago? Like seven years ago when we first connected to talk about a project and we did we did an interview together and this idiot here butchered it and didn't push save correctly and it, it just kind of disappeared after that? Is that possible oh, it's been that long? Oh, I remember that. God damn. That was ages ago. That couldn't be seven years. Seven ye- it couldn't be seven years. I was going to say, man, time flies. It could very well be. So the moral of the Are story for... Are you serious? Oh, my God. Yeah, no I way think... it's that long. I'm pretty sure it is. It's at least six. If my if my inner time calculator is that effed up, I have real problems. Well, COVID, oh my God. COVID fucked us all up, man. I'm telling you. Yeah, it's been weird. It's been weird. But the, the punchline of this is stay after me and keep coming after me because you'll get on this show no matter how messed up it is. There's the punchline <laughs> for all those people out there. Hey, Jim, I'd love to be on the show. Well, this guy, this guy's been waiting and waiting. Yeah, I've been waiting for seven years to do this. So, welcome to the big. Do you have hope? Yeah, I was gonna say. So it does happen eventually if you stay after it. Yeah. So, where do you? We gave to... a great interview. Oh, I know. We did so well, we could, There's no way we're gonna match that. Yeah, I know. We should just I, probably put a fork in this and. We should just put a fork in this and say, so just call it a night. So what have you? What have you been up to the last seven years? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, the last year and a half, oh my God, um, it seems like, how how long has COVID been now? Like, how long has it been locked down? Like a year? At, at least a year, yeah. See, I can't relate to the real world because I'm one of the people, there's different people. There's like, my buddy, uh, director buddy of mine, great, fantastic uh, director, um, uh, um just I was just on the phone with him and he was saying that he'd gotten back to work and been going around the, the states and sh- shooting things and he's working on a, a like a, a, a docu series you know for the Discovery Channel and not what he wants to be working on because he's a he's a film director but the point is other people take COVID like not very seriously they're out there without their masks on they're living their lives they're uh, not scared of the world. I, on the other hand, like have battened down the hatches and grown my beard out to like seven inches long and my hair's down my back. And when I go to the store or leave the apartment, I'm double masked on all occasions. I have 
hand sanitizer in my pocket, Lysol in the back pocket. And when I walk through the store, I feel like I'm in a Petri dish and I'm like, oh, I got to get out of here. I get the fear everywhere I go, you know, I'll open doors with my elbow and kick doors open with my foot. Was there a question? Well, See, I, I, I asked you what you've been up to, and I, I now I need a okay. picture of this for the the show notes too. By the way, the new look, I guess. So just so you oh, know. I'll show you. I'll show you. I look like a <laughs> dangerous individual. I'm, I look like I look like I probably sell meth and drive a Harley Davidson. Well, um, we'll have to compare it with the uh, FBI most wanted list too. So just so you know. Yeah, yeah. I look. I I don't. I'm not like someone that you would walk by on the street and be like, oh, he looks like a trustworthy individual. <laughs> That's not happening right now. But I really have, like, I can't relate to the world. So when you say, what have you done the last year? I, I've just been quietly working on projects and trying to right when the real world comes back and we can all, I, I live in the world of like five, to seven two to three million dollar movies like small movies even though that's a big amount of money but those for movies that's not a big amount of money and that world has sort of like vanished with covid because just bringing a covid team to your movie and the insurance that you have to pay for blows your budget up and so basically what's been going on with covid is like indie films aren't happening big big movies are still happening and and people that have no money at all and are just running around doing gorilla awesome stuff that's that's still happening so i'm the guy that's not participated in anything for the last year except behind the scenes you know building projects on paper um getting them ready for when five to seven two to three million dollar films come back see i haven't even thought about that and that's why i'm glad you're here because i mean i noticed there's been a massive wave of uh, podcasts created in the last year right all competing for the same space and of course you're sitting here talking Mm -hmm. about people making gorilla movies out there with their iphones and whatever yeah I mean, if so it, it's no under the same you're space. Zero, you're able to shoot. If you got no money, you're able to shoot. If you've got a ton of money and you can, like, COVID, uh, you know, br- fly the family out and put everybody up in the same place and quarantine your whole crew, then you can afford to shoot. But everybody in that, that middle indie ground place has been shut down. So all of us are competing for the same capital, too. That's like, we want to be the first indie movie to shop you know what i mean to get that yes stamp it's a race there's like all these indie films that are half financed and i'm a part of a bunch of those um basically and that's what i've been doing the last year is trying to get one of those to pop and and be first to bat when the the indie movie craze happens again because netflix and all these you know all these streaming services and they're all thirsty for product um, and so the indie filmmakers are like, you know, it's become a real shark tank for for us trying to get our movies made. I was going to say, it has to be ultra, I mean, it's always been ultra competitive for that indie dollar, so to speak, right? Because there's never yeah, enough of sure. them to go around. But how do you, okay, so let's get nuts and bolts and let's get deep into this. How do you separate, I mean, mm-hmm. how do you try to be the cream of the crop and how do you try to get above and get into that? I mean, because we all have ideas. But, I mean, yeah. there has to be a well, process and get it. Go tell, talk me through it. Well, I don't know if this is the right process or the wrong process, honestly, because I've produced three films in my life. I produced Benjamin Troubles uh, 12 years ago. A couple years after that, I made a film called Fifth Passenger. And in 2019, I made the biggest film of my life so far, as far as capital goes, a film called Hell on the Border. And I'm now working on a film called Star Crew, and actually t- two other films um, that are uh, not, I'm more of, I'm more of a, a producer on the side getting hired to work on those films. They're not mine, if that makes any sense. Um, and I, the only way that I l- l- have been able to figure this out is just be friends with everybody that you, that you like and you can, you can tolerate. Um, and like, for instance, I've got a movie that 
I'm going to go meet some people that have some capital and have a studio and want to work with me. And I was going out there alone just with my film star crew. But then I went, you know what? He's got capital. He's got a studio. He's got friends. It would be much more beneficial to me if these other projects I was working on, I brought with me. So I called the directors and the producers and the, the people in charge and kind of went, Hey, I've got a meeting for my film, but maybe that could lead to your film or your film as well. Can I bring you to the meeting and, you know, team up? And so I think that that's, that's been my approach is to just, you know, kind of spin plates and, and be a part of as many projects as you can so that when that one gets financed, you have at least a place in it instead of being like the loan shark that is only going to get his movie made and nobody else's, you know? Yeah, well, you have to have... Well, spinning plates is probably a good analogy for that, right? Cause you've yeah, gotta, for sure. You've got, you've got to kind of be a lot of places to be somewhere at the end of all this, or anywhere. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a part of a bunch of really cool projects that are like all half-financed and all about to go, but we'll see when and where they they happen you know um that's been my not like strategy but i'm also like i've never been much for the hollywood game of that's that uh there's real sharks in this town you know i back in the day there was a quote by that guy um denzel washington played him he was a heroin dealer in new york and he like basically took over the whole heroin gangster scene in new york for years uh, Denzel played him. The uh, uh, the other guy. Who else is in that movie? Russell Crowe. Russell Russell Crowe. Yeah, that's his name. I think that's his name. You're talking to the wrong um, person. But continue. <laughs> all right, but this guy was a gangster, right? He was like the he controlled New York heroin for like ten years, millions of dollars, just badass. You got to be hard to to be that guy. So they made a movie about his life, and. Um, he was selling his story to Hollywood and his quote was like, I have never been in a room with more dangerous and manipulative sharky people than when I tried to sell my story to Hollywood. Those people are dangerous. So like I've, I've realized that I'm not one of those people that, that are, are willing to like step on my friends for, for my movie so i went what's my best second best shot is like to spread the love and and try not to be the the shark you know don't be what you're what you don't have it in you to be yeah i was gonna say that's i i i, I don't have that in me either so we come from a, that basic so let's go back years i'm sure like this happens to me all the time I get my friends' movies made all the time. I've I, a number of, and I won't say like who, but <laughs> I've <laughs> launched a number of my friends' projects, and 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 it's very often that I'll I'll do that. Um, but getting my own project off the ground that I get to direct, that I get to 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 tell my story, my writing, etc., has has been a a trick. Well, I, I've often said that I have to make. Uh, a bunch of people famous before I become famous myself, so I follow yeah. that completely. Like it's it's not it's not about what I'm trying to do. It's about what other people are trying to do and give them whatever that is a little bit of juice. I guess. Yeah, and would... as long as you as long as you're you're some part of it, you have real friends in the end, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. I rather I yeah. rather I rather walk away happy and knowing that I can sleep at night instead of saying, "Man, you know, I went out and really squeezed that Hollywood actor guy and ended his career tonight." <laughs> yeah, I, I won't even. All right, say I, I, I won't. This is this will. Um, Hem, the Hemsworth brothers, right? I made friends with one of those guys, and um, I got him a great part in a movie that my good buddy was directing. But that part was mine. But because I wanted my buddy's movie to go, I was like, "You should meet with Hemsworth, and you guys should talk." And then the part that was set aside for me as soon as they met went to Hemsworth because he's bigger than me. And that, I mean, in, in name value, you know? Oh, he's bigger than me, too. He kicked my ass. <laughs> but 
I just you you know what I meant. And, and, well, and this this is a clean shaven you, right? This isn't the modern you. This is the oh, clean this shaven. isn't the new dangerous me. The new dangerous me could take all three Hemsworth in a headlock, man. <clears throat> I kill them all. But <laughs> no, but the, yeah. So I I, I I'm I, I hope that I when I do that, I always hope that karmically it's going to come back to me and so far so good you know like i i got an i got a different part in that movie and that particular director has been kind to me and we're good friends and and hopefully the future brings bright things because he's blowing up so if you can blow people up for. around you yes, yeah i think that's the whole game is if you can if you can if you can bring success to your friends and your friends stay somewhat loyal to you then everybody's a winner grounded not loyal that's a better word what's that old what's that old line of uh, rising tide rises all ships i think something like Ooh, that. that's a good one if, if that isn't it we're, we're gonna trademark that or whatever it is and put that on some shirts the rising <laughs> tide rises the rising tide rises all ships is that raises think... all ships a rising tide raises all ships so there you go so there we go and that's how not i feel quite about as it good as... My life is ruled by a tiny furry overlord. No. That's been my life for the last year. I got a cat. I oh, see. I'm oh. oh, I'm surprised you went cat. Oh boy! I have to She's send you last week's podcast, by the way, because I had a, a cat communicator on. So you'll you'll probably enjoy it. Yeah, my lady made me get a cat, and <laughs> I love her to death. She's amazing. But the lady or the life cat? Changes. <laughs> both of them they're both wonderful people and you got to treat them the same you know if you treat if you start treating your animals like they're not humans you're in for real real problems i totally agree that's for sure yeah. they, i mean they become part of the family for sure yeah it's just like you don't want to treat humans like animals same same thing well most of the time <laughs> <laughs> So let's, let's, oh, let's, yeah, unless you're really kinky. <laughs> so let's think back for, uh, uh, probably a decade or so. What, what what made you want to get into acting? I mean, besides the obvious glitz and glamour, there had to have been something. Yeah, what got me into acting? Um, I just wanted to be um, super famous and rich, and I thought that would be the, the trade for me. No, um the what really got me into acting i've told this story so many times i i should i keep telling myself that i should come up with different answers for each interview <laughs> but then you're just some mysterious character and they're like what the hell if somebody really is your fan and they're like they don't know which story to believe so i'll tell the real story um if you can't tell already there's like seven people in my head i'm not really one person i'm, I'm multiple personalities that all try to tell themselves they're a good person um uh the answer was the question was i flaked again what was what were we talking about what got, what got you into acting oh what got me into acting yeah uh i was five years old man five years old i was sitting i don't know who brought me it must have been my parents i couldn't figure out who else would have brought me to this uh a community theater production in mccall idaho of Peter Pan and I was five and I remember the actors starting to think happy thoughts they had them on wires and they started to fly around the stage and I was like I want to do that that's so you know I was mesmerized as five it was a really well done production community theater production of Peter Pan and it just blew my mind and from that point on I knew and that's really trippy, you know, because I've met people that are exactly the opposite, that didn't know what they wanted to do with their, with their lives until late, late in life or something, you know? Mm -hmm. I've known from, like, a small, my, like, that memory's really old. I'm 43. That's a, I was five. But I can remember that moment of watching those people fly around on stage as, like, a defining moment in my life. I, I, I started bitching at my parents to move to L.A., I started watching TV and analyzing movies and like five, five to eight, I'm like yelling at my parents to bring me to 
to LA and I'm trying to convince my parents to be like stage moms. <laughs> I hope, you know, <laughs> stage mom or stage, like the, the worst parents in the world. And thank God my parents didn't do that and listen to me. But of course they didn't want their kid running off to Hollywood. So they didn't let me move to LA, but I was fixated on it. So, you know, high school and, and, um, everywhere I went, I was in community theater and, and my high school plays and my junior high, you know, I, I was fixated. Uh, as soon as I could leave the, the cage, um, cage, my parents are great people. I <laughs> call it a cage, but as soon as I could leave the house, I was 17. I left, I moved to LA. I was very lucky cause I was in a community theater production in San Luis Obispo, California. Um, and this, there was a manager in the audience that just approached me when I was 17 and said, I liked, I like you. I like your vibe. I, I liked your performance. What are you doing after high school? And I said, well, I want to be an actor. I was going to move to LA and study and try to do it. And she was like, well, I'll be your manager and I'll get you an agent. And I was like, okay. And so when I graduated, I packed my bags and she, she kept her word and we worked together for maybe the first five years of my career. And um, that's the story, basically. Well, that's quite incredible, though, because, I mean, we always talk about that, that crossroads or that moment of life, right? And there it was for you. I mean, have, being at the right place at the right time and meeting the right person. I mean, otherwise... Oh, God, that has to happen. That has to happen so many times in an actor's career. Yeah, as I was gonna say, that's probably not the, the last time you could tell me a story about bumping into somebody or being at the right place at the right time, even though you yeah. you feel like it wasn't the right place at the right time, but it ended up years later it was. Yeah, and like the weirdest thing in, in this in this in, in entertainment too is like your biggest mistake can sometimes be like your the best move you made and very strange things like things that that you really wanted to happen not happening can be really great for you um it's a very strange business uh acting and movie making and 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 uh you know what we're all doing here i think is trying to just express the human condition as best as we can um through 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 the art of like you know film and television which is basically all of the best arts in the world in one bag. If you think about it, a film is a painting, it's a music, it's writing, it's poetry, it's the set design, it's architecture, it's costumes, it's, it's everything that you can think of in a, every art that's ever been imagined in one box. And I think that's why film appeals to so many people, of course, is it's like all the great arts packed together to try to say something about who and what we are. How could you not get off on that? So this is going to sound like a real easy question, but I know it's not going to be for you. Okay. Help me, help me define the difference. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. Just, just listen just to the question. I'm an idiot. No, hey, no, this, this is going to no, be a really easy question, but not for you. Cause you're dumb as a rock. No, no, no let's, let let, let's, let's listen to the question first and then let me, then you'll understand why I'm asked, why I've layered it in that way. <laughs> help, help me understand the difference between filming like a television show and a movie. Ooh, yeah. Okay, yeah, see, yeah. I was right. It's a real, it's a really sounding simple question, but for you to answer it, it's not going to be. No. Okay. So, for instance, like filming a television show, it depends on the category of television show you're talking about. If it's a sitcom, which they're dying out, thank God. I hate. I've always hated sitcoms. But there's still a few that hanging around. If it's a sitcom, like five, three camera comedy type of thing, like uh, Seinfeld, etc., Friends, blah blah blah, y you go to work five days a week, uh, and on the weekends you're rehearsing for the next week, and you rehearse the first four days, all the shots that you're going to shoot, and then you bring in the live studio audience to to fill in the laughter that, that the canned laughter can't uh, they, you, they want as much real laughter as they can get and then on Friday you shoot the actual episode that you've been rehearsing with the live studio audience there and if you make mistakes they, they go back and shoot again and there's like a guy in the crowd 
that runs around hyping everybody up to laugh again at the same joke they've seen filmed five times. It's a really weird thing to be involved in. Um, versus like if you're in a one hour drama without a live studio audience, that's much more like a film, but you're still working five days a week. Um, but every day counts. Every day is a shooting day. Um, and in the past, film and television were very different in the, in the sense that film had a big, big budget and you, you had these, like, we have a whole six months to shoot this movie and $80 billion and you've got a nice trailer and you're getting a good paycheck and all those things and TV, um, Oof, this is a tough question to, to answer, but there was a, a a big difference between like whether you wanted to be a film star or a TV star, or a, or a theatrical actor known for your your Broadway stage presence, stage work. But now the 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 lines have really crossed because television has gotten so much better with the advent of streaming and commercials going away and HBO and Netflix and mostly the streaming thing has made film quality television a very much a real thing. There's so much, there's so many great shows now that are just as well funded, if not more well funded than big movies. Um, so there's not a lot of difference these days between film and, and television unless you're talking about the sitcom but you know one hour dramas like game of thrones that's a 12 million dollar episode of the that's a that's a feature film you get to watch um you know those type of tv shows are are growing in number and so the the lines between the difference of filming tv and film is the, the only real difference is is um, how long you work. Um, it's tougher to maintain that I'm going to be only a film actor mentality that, that used to exist so much because TV has gotten so damn good. So I guess, I guess the next follow-up question, which is extremely loaded again, are, are mm -hmm. we, I mean, are we going to just get to a point where it's video, where it's not film, it's not TV, because if it's streaming, it doesn't matter, you know what I'm saying, to the big context, what it is. I mean, I guess if it comes in segments, we'll always kind of think of it as TV, but if it if it just rolls together as a, like a movie would. Well, it does. I mean, the, these great, these these shows that, that I get hooked on, I binge, you know, I'll watch 23 episodes in a row, like a 23-hour movie especially during COVID. Um, I mean, yeah, I, the, the, the difference between, I mean, what's the question exactly? I don't, I'm not, I'm well, not I'm just quite. Saying, I mean, I, you were kind of saying how TV, TV is getting bigger budgets and acting more like yeah. film. I mean, I'm seeing this kind of merge point in the middle here where it's going to be something, whatever it is. Oh Yeah. I guess, it, I mean, it's video entertainment. I don't know what it's... I think there's going to be a new word developed out of all this. Oh, yeah, you're, like, you're right. Maybe that's true. I mean, re, like reality TV, and and you've got these those other things like the, the Discovery Channel type shows that are shot really poorly, and, you know, they're just, they're just running around with cameras. They're not worrying about lighting or, or, or making the shot really appealing. Um uh, the, that stuff is still, you know, what I would consider TV. But then you say, you know, you like, for example, Game of Thrones. I, I, you can't really tell the difference between that and a film. It's the same, it's the same thing. The people are making the same amount of money. The artists are all just as incredible as as film artists. Um, and what's going to end up in the middle? God knows. I don't know. Yo, I guess you know what it is. It's called crappy indie films. That that's what, and maybe this is a loaded question, but that's how I've been the most disappointed 
in my life in the last 15 years is the the advent of the digital camera has destroyed quality in um, filmmaking because there used there was a time when indie film was hot right 20 years ago maybe 20 25 years ago where the where the few people that could actually went out and bought film cameras or rented film Panavision cameras that shot on film and made independent cinema that like a real thing. If you remember that existed and there were only a few directors um, that did it that, you know, there were like 20 hot indie film directors and you were like, wow, I want to be like one of those guys. Well, the digital camera came out and then suddenly everybody could afford to shoot movies and it went from 500 movies a year that were being made quickly to 5,000 films a year that get made quickly to five years later where we are now 50,000 movies a year I think get made in the world and so you've got all this crap and I can't tell you I've been on a number of sets where I've just been like wow this is going to be a giant piece of poo but there's a paycheck here, but there's no story and nobody here knows what they're doing. And there's a bunch of kids running around with cameras that they don't know how they even freaking work. <laughs> and it, there's, you know, so there's like all this, this, uh, content, but the real cream of the crop stuff is, um, you know, hard to sift through. You got to watch more movies these days to find that, that great stuff. There's more junk out there. And there's more people that don't know what they're doing, getting access to funds to make movies. And, and that's a real drag. I, they, the, the death of film, I think, has been a real bummer in general for the industry. I don't like the digital cameras. I, I've given way to the fact that that's just the way things are now. But... Um, I think it's hurt the quality of. Uh, well, does it, does it, I, the, but does it ever come quality, back though? Does we ever do well, we ever get to a point where there. they make thirty five thousand instead of fifty? Uh, I hope so. I hope it. it yeah, that it rubber bands. Because it, I guess at some point, you, you you know the, what is it that separates from the cream? The cream rises to the top, something like yeah. that. Um, it's not that everybody shouldn't be allowed to make movies because they should. Movies are great and movies are fun and movies are beautiful. And, and some movies that are shot on video and that have that video look, I, if the story's there, I still love it. You know, even if it's really, really badly produced and it, it doesn't have all the things that you expect from a film, if the story is there, I'm still a fan. But it is harder to run around as an actor because there's so many projects and there's so much. It, it's it's also made the the level of uh, pay go way way down. Um, actors twenty years ago were making so much more money than actors are making today. But I think that's been this sort of the same for almost everybody since the two thousand and nine crash. Um, the world has figured out how not to pay anybody for their work. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. So, okay, so since we're kind of at this point, this kind of was talked yeah. through in my chat room about, we'll, we'll say it, we'll call it big Hollywood, right? How they keep rehashing yeah. and rebooting and all of that. You know what I'm talking about? How they just, you know, yeah. Star Wars 45. Uh, yeah. Is that ever, I mean, are we ever going to get a new creative Hollywood project or are they just going to keep rebooting and rebranding and recirculating the same stuff they've kind of been doing? Well, isn't that something that at least for most of my conscious life, I've heard that attitude that uh, it's just the same old stuff. Um, but every once in a while, something breaks through, right? Um and, and not everybody can be a genius and, and not every film can be genius. You know, I would say like the matrix is just another sci-fi movie. If you want to take that kind of attitude, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. But the matrix is also like, wow. I mean, that movie blew 
my mind one of my top 20 best films ever made i think that but um ah man i get lost i got lost again in my own mind well i i I wonder though it, it has probably to do more with economics than it does creativity it's safe making another star wars movie because they know yeah. it'll, it'll, it'll sell X number of uh, tickets and X number of merchandise yeah. or thereabouts. I'm sure there, there's probably a, there is probably a metric, no matter well, how many they the make. that is the problem with the studios and with big, big, big money pictures is it's got to have a graphic novel. Uh, it's got to be a comic book movie or it's got to have big movie stars in it um, or it's not going to make money. And they, that's the attitude, and it's the truth in, in a way, too. You know, what everybody believes is, ends up being the truth. We're, we're 100 monkeys. But every once in a while, something breaks through that, all the rules, and changes things. Like, um, you know, these smaller films that have ended up winning the Oscar that, that com- are competing against these $150 billion, $150 million, $200 million Star Wars type films um uh, that that kid with the drums won the oscar uh i forget the name of the movie but it was a great movie and it was just about a kid beating on his drums and an overzealous teacher um can't, whip whiplash yeah whiplash three million dollar film or five million dollar film ends up winning the oscar over everything else out there and then two years later moonlight which was a beautiful independent film three million dollar film about a young gay black man in Compton growing up, played by three different men in uh, the 13 and 20s and, and then in his 40s. Beautiful movie. Um, so, you know, like the, there's always going to be something new and some new story to tell, but we're going to always be overwhelmed with Batman 14. But I love Batman. So, like, we want the. We, I think in a in a very real way, we want the remakes. We want the reboots. We want we want to see a new look, uh, a new take on the stuff we love. I'm stoked that Star Wars uh, 14 is coming out. I love those movies. Um, some more than others, but The Mandalorian was beautiful, man. I don't know if you're with me, but those two seasons of television were so cool. I geeked out big time. Um, and who's making Star Wars? That dude, John Favreau, who 20 years ago was just this independent filmmaker kid that made a movie called Swingers and worked his way into the system. And now he's, make, he's making Star Wars. So there's, there's beautiful stories and there's beautiful movies. that, And I think the, the rehashed, you know, when the reboots go bad, we all go, oh, my God. But when they're cool, we love them. Um, and God bless the people that are still working to bring us something new. Uh, I'd like to think that I was one of those people. Um, but we're all just artists trying to get trying to get our stuff made. And um, I think it's all pretty damn cool. I, I, I'm pretty happy with the, the amount of entertainment out there. Um, it's just frustrating. I'm blabbing away, but it's just frustrating the, the the digital camera because it has made so much content that would, never would have been made before uh, n- made, and, and there's just so many bad movies out there. So uh, I, I, I've got a question for you, but more so for my listeners because they're gonna yeah. they're gonna love this one. Um, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, because we're talking about all these remakes and all this other stuff. And I'm, I'm sitting here, and I have a, I have this kind of open and half-cocked question. I'm trying to figure uh-huh. out a franchise that is struggling more now than James Bond. Because it used to be cool. I mean, he has to have the car. I mean, he would talk in his, his watch. But now everybody's talking in their watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's almost like Fast and Furious took over the James Bond franchise. Yeah. And, but even that Bond. now is kind of like, where does that go? Like it's yeah, you know like it, even even if that is true right where you know we we bridge those two together, where are you at yeah. now? I mean, yeah, how, well, how it's getting pretty pretty crazy. But those movies are great. You gotta you gotta well, like 
Oh, I know, but I'm talking like you know, it used to be, like it used to be killer the uh, the Porsche and like I said, talking to his wrist. I mean, come on, that was amazing at the time. But now yeah. I'm sitting here going, well, how do you? What do you do? If I'm trying to yeah, write the new James Bond, yeah. what, what 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 is going to impact people the same way that did? Yeah, uh, that's a tough one, isn't it? Like, <laughs> and that's the stuff that gets. And James Bond will continue to get made. The Bond yeah. movies won't go away. Um, I but don't what, think what they'll will ever have, go away. What will have that flash that makes me go, "Wow, he's you know." And then well, my kid will be sitting here. <laughs> my kid will be sitting here going. All, it, it has to be a good story. It has to, it, you know, it can't just be cool because you can shoot something that's that that's just really pretty. Like, all right, for instance, he'll never hire me, but I'll, I don't care. That guy that makes all the big boomy movies, you know, uh, t- and he dates all the models, and he's everybody knows that he's just about explosions and no story. You know, Transformers. Come on, help me oh. out. What's this guy's name? Uh, oh yeah, it'll come back in a second. day. He did the Bruce Willis movie with the big thing, the comet that goes crashing into Earth. Uh, I can't think of the director's name, but all he does is explosions and big CGI, and then he throws a couple movie stars in there and calls it a movie like that. For for me, that stuff doesn't resonate, and and I don't think it resonates with the public that much either. I think your best chance of breaking through is telling a, a great story. And if those elements are a part of your story, all the, all the better, um, the cool gadgets and the blow explosions and the big cars and, and all that stuff. But you can't just put that stuff on screen and expect to be a hit. Well, you're, you're like, a writer. You're a writer. So help me out yeah. here. How, how hard is it yeah. to write today? Uh, it's really, really, really hard. But some of the greatest writers uh, have come out to Hollywood. Fictional writers and uh, uh, in, in novelists have come to try to take their hand at screenplay or, or even graphic uh, novel uh, writers have tried to come and uh, comic book writers have tried to make a name for themselves writing screenplays. It's really hard to... Uh, make a living writing screenplays. Uh, writers, bottom line, that's the tr- trippiest thing about this whole game. Not very respected as far as the the game goes. It's like screenplays are a dime a dozen. And so even if you write a really, really good one, it's not so easy to find people out there that'll take the time to read it, let alone take the time to put money behind it, let alone take the time to actually put their hours of their lives into making it. Um, so you, you know, writing it, there's, there's a reason that, that there's not hundreds of thousands of millions of writers in the world. It's not an easy thing to do. I like, I, it, it's funny because as a consumer, right, when you watch a good movie, you just go, Oh, that was easy. That was so cool. But you know, like, I could do that. <laughs> but when you really go to break it down and you really actually screen, for instance, just a little bit of uh, past the layman camp, when you write a screenplay, you've got all these rules that you have to follow that are like Hollywood screenplay format story rules. You've got 120 beats in every movie that you should have on page 17, page 18, page 19, page 20, uh, you have all these things like the turn of the story and the A story and B story. And the B story in the movie should support the A story. And when the B story in the movie makes its turn, that turn should support the A A story and, and, and support it. The best films have all these little things that are put together. And screenplay writing really is this like formatted, hardcore structural it's taught in college you know uh, you you get you can get a master's in it in screenplay writing and it's um it's not for the weak of heart it's not easy to sit down and write a good movie um and i think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that it is um the last movie that i wrote i spent three years on working with four different hired writers 
and and it's just now that I'm starting to like my screenplay. And this is after hiring four professionals to help me write my own shit, you know? <laughs> I, I'm sitting here laughing. I, I know that, uh, but that has to be, on some level, it has to be painful, right? Because you think you're, you're talented enough to do this yourself. I mean, you're smart enough to realize that you can't do it yourself, but so, on some level, it has to be painful. It's really painful because the whole industry is built upon somebody taking the credit for the film. And the bottom line is, when a movie's made, it's not one writer. It's never one writer. But one writer gets credit. And there's all these weird frickin' rules, like, uh, you know, in the if you join the Writers Guild, you become a WGA member of, like, who gets credit for the movie. And there's all these ghost writers that are out there writing movies for $80,000 a screenplay, $120,000 a screenplay, but nobody knows who they are because they're just taking the money instead of actually writing. And, you know, you could get your name on a film, but if you get your name on the movie, you're probably not going to get paid for it. Weird stuff, weird stuff. It's, it, it twists my brain up in knots because I don't, go by the all the Hollywood which means it's probably why I haven't like blown up yet but for instance you know when my movie comes out all five of those writers me and the four guys that I hired are all going to be they're all going to get credit in the writer slot um, and you know there's there's just all these people you know a director of a movie isn't necessarily the reason that the movie is good um, but somebody's got to take that credit and take that position. So there's all these people fighting when really like three or four people, five people direct a movie, the executive producer, the onset producers, the director, the DP, they're all uh, the, the, the lead digital effect artists. They're, those guys are, and girls are all sort of like the director, but one guy gets to say I'm the director. And the producers all have to go by the wayside and, and continue to be producers. And nobody knows their names. Nobody cares. You know? And oh, yeah. And, that's the, fun, that's and the worst how, part of this all. I mean, 90% of the people that work on this project never... Yeah, know. never get credit for it. And so, yeah, of course, it's, it's heart-wrenching. But if you align your idea of success... Um, not so much with credit, but with being like, I was so overjoyed. I would rather like have a very, very, very small part to do with a very beautiful movie that's well received, that is impactful, even if it's not well received, even if nobody sees it and it's impactful and like whoever does see it gets their heart shook. I would rather be a very small part in that than the leading role in a piece of piece of dirt. And like, I've been the star of some bad movies before and it's no fun. It's like, okay, there's all these people making money and they're slapping a bunch of names on the movie. It's Danny Trejo and it's this person and that person. And it's a, it's a, and I get to work with these guys that I've looked up to, but I'm playing the lead bad guy but the movie was you know ugh. there are those movies that they just slap slap like c list b list one a list actor on and then they, they just spit them out uh they're really it's an awful feeling in your heart when you're a part of them and you can look around and know before the movie comes out that it's already going to be a bad movie and it, there's this weird feeling when you're involved in a good movie that you know that you don't really know that it's going to be good, but you, you, you like have this weird sort of like sense of like, Hey, I might be involved in something here. That's, that's neat. And it doesn't really matter in the end. It, if you get credit for all that, it's for me, I, I just want to be a part of stories that shake people's hearts, minds or groins, uh, make people feel, so I'm going um, to ask you the ultimate 
loaded. Well, this yeah. isn't the ultimate loaded question. I kind of asked you that earlier. This will be a little bit easier. So you're so not can saying I this, get this out. Actually, yeah. Be, before you ask, yeah. like for instance, nobody's seen instant and I'm going to plug that right now. There's a Go movie ahead, called instant instant by Rod Roddenberry and Roddenberry entertainment short film. It's free. See it on YouTube. I've been involved in 70 plus projects in my life. And the mo- one of the proudest, if not the proudest moments or performances I've ever had was in that little short film that only like 10,000 people I think have seen, but it's great and it's beautiful. And the 10,000 people that watched that movie got their heart shook. And that's what's important. It's not really about the big fame, fame and fortune and glitz and glamour and all that stuff that they try to tell you it's about. So, well, let's ask this real, real doozy of a question. I've got a few more to follow up with this this point. Um, yeah. Okay, so this guy has a screenplay done. What does he does he hire an agent? How does he get this thing shopped around to get it moving? Well, you can't hire an agent first and foremost. Um, that's a mistake a lot of people make, and there's a bunch of sharks in Hollywood that uh, you have to get an agent to represent you for a percentage. Um, and that percentage should never be more than 15% and it should be somewhere between five and 15% depending on how long, you, how well you get away, get along with your agent or how big your agent is as a, as a power. Like you, you know, you get in with a CAA, an agent over there, you, that agency has power. The, the, the agents there package films. They, 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 they represent the producers, the actors, the writers, the directors they represent the whole package and so you get over there you know you're going to get meetings that count but you have to ha- you have to get somebody even if they're not CAA or they're not one of the big agencies it's ch- sometimes just as cool to have a small boutique agency that isn't well known t- if somebody's working hard and believes in you and they're doing their best as a manager to set up meetings with with uh, people in Hollywood, you you have to find that relationship with an agent or a manager. You can't hire them. If you do that, you're just throwing away money because um, it doesn't work like that. It's always it, it's just everybody in this town works for a percentage, uh, almost. And I can say that like almost a hundred percent truthfully. Like writers, it, it's almost never. Uh, you know, like a flat fee sort of like nine to five thing. It's usually a cut. And, um, you got to get somebody to believe in you first and foremost, if you have a screenplay, um, and it depends on how much you care about ownership and whether that gets done right. For instance, a really lovely friend of mine who started his career about 15 years ago, his name's James Bird. Everybody in the world should see his films. He's made three really brilliant independent films, none of which has been hugely commercially successful, but all three films by James Bird, if you go check them out, wonderful films. They've got their everything that makes a good movie in them. In them. Now, I was tooting his horn and forgot what we were talking about. Oh, we were talking about pitch the screenplay around and you got there. So Okay, okay so... Okay, so wait. So he, right? Yeah. Back in the day, 15 years ago, he's, his career's booming now. He's, he's hustling. He's blowing up. He's getting deals left and right, working, I can't say where, but good places um, for big people now um, and getting his name out there in a big way. 15 years ago, he sold his first screenplay and let it get made by somebody else and took the money, and it was only like 10 grand, 15 grand, something like that small amount of money but he was like man i i want to get my movie made so i'll take the money and i'll let them make it they made a horrible movie out of his really good writing something that he put his heart and his mind into and he decided right then and there i'm never i'm never doing it again 10 years later he's hustling and working his butt off he's written 30 nine screenplays at my last count i think he's like to 45 now but He's got a movie and it's going to go and it's going to go for like $1.9 million and he's going to get to make it and he's going to get to direct it. 
Um, but he's only going to make like, you know, uh, who knows what, not, not, a, not a ton of money. He gets an offer during this process from a famous actress for $1 million. She says for $1 million, I will buy your movie right now. You can have a million dollars, but I want all of it, the rights. And I want you gone. He says no. Right? <laughs> how do you say no to that? Right? <laughs> I was gonna Crazy. Say, how do you say Crazy. Yeah. He says no. But but he does he does write by the people that he had on board to make this thing. So he ends up making it for one point nine, but he doesn't get to keep that money. That money goes to everybody else that is in the movie and made the movie and distributes the movie, blah blah blah. He just gets his little director's fee. But he gets to tell his story his way with his vision and his team and his family and his creative circle. And I think that's that there's a difference between people that write for money and, and not that it's bad or good necessarily, just that there's a difference. If you want to write for money and you're a great writer, you can probably make a lot of money in this town because writing good screenplays is really, really hard. Um, but if you want to make money and be involved in the production of your movie and own your movie. Um, and then you better write it and raise the funds and do all the work that that requires, you know? Yeah. So, okay. Before we run out of time, cause we've got about two minutes left and I don't know how, how that happened. It seems like tonight does flew by, which it does when we have a good conversation going where, I mean, besides yeah. Twitter, where can people find you? What's going on with you right now? Uh, yeah, people can find me, uh, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm like one of the easiest guys to find in the world, except my name is really hard to spell, but I was going to say minus Manu the spelling Lente. of your name, but we, we covered minus that earlier. So good. Of my name. Yeah. If you know who Manu Ente Reme is, you can probably find a way to get a hold of me. I'm on Twitter and all the, the social media pages at Manu Ente Reme. Um, figure out how to spell it. The last name starts with an I. The first name is Manu put that into IMDb and yeah, I was gonna say, if you, you if go. you get mono I in there, you're, you're pretty, you're pretty, you're going to get there. Yeah. Mostly. And I'm down creatively to work with anybody. I'm very open and it's, it's always been uh, a good thing to me. You know, I, I'm, I'm working on this really cool new uh, animated movie and out of London because these people were Star Trek fans from back in the day. And I was, I'm out there just saying, Hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm available. And we started talking and now we're doing the, I'm a part of this incredible, um, um, animated film. I can't say the name of it, unfortunately, but, um, I, I think it's good to be, you know, there's a, there's a certain sense of like, I don't ever want to be one of those. If I get to that level where I want to be, I don't want to be one of those people that's it is it's impossible to get a hold of. You hear these wonderful stories about like uh, Bill Murray, right? <laughs> Everybody says wonderful things about Bill Murray because he doesn't he doesn't uh, have any representation, and he just gives out his phone number. And if you believe in your project and you have Bill's number, and he'll he'll come to work for you. And I, I sort of have that same attitude as like, hey. I'm I'm not hard to find. You can look me up on IMDb. You can look my agents and my managers up on IMDb. You can find me directly on on in, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at Manu Reme and talk to me. And if 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 we find common ground, then we'll do some art together. That's well, the way well, my friend, I hey, I appreciate you for bugging me, and we, I'm glad we did this again. Let's not let's not wait seven years again to do this again, okay? Yeah, let's not. And before we go, since there's only like two seconds left, please, everybody, keep an eye out for Star Crew. It's the first film from the circuitfilm.com. I've been working Thank on you it for, for listening three to plus years. Now. Stay tuned for they details say in and Hollywood saving money at the back every room seven to ten years is how program. long it takes to get please a film from concept so you all the way to the screen. But the Star Crew, which is a lovely crushing together of like Galaxy Quest and Shaun of the Dead uh, will be coming to theaters in a couple of years. I've raised a bunch of money for it. I'm looking for a partner at circuitfilm.com. Keep an eye out for Star Crew in a couple of years. That'll be directly 
from Monument to Airman. Airman. That's my work. Nobody else's. Uh, uh, except there's a bunch of famous people in it. Um, All right, my keep friend. an eye out for Starfleet. We are out of time. Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. All right. <laughs>